Welcome to the final Bible study on the book of Esther. It's good to see you today. Uh, you can see me. I can't really see you. But I want to thank you for your faithfulness in being a part of this Bible study as we have looked at one of the most exciting stories in the scripture, and that is the book of Esther. Now, really, the book of Esther needs to be read in its entirety. It's not that long. But it's such a fast-moving story and such a dramatic story. And what we're going to do today is bring this story to a close and then make three very important observations about the book of Esther. When we stopped last week, at the conclusion of our study last week, the evil Haman, who had come up with this plot, to kill, to exterminate, to eliminate the entire Jewish nation had been discovered. He had His plot had been revealed by Esther. And at the conclusion of the seventh chapter, they hanged Haman on the gallows, the very gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. A great reversal had taken place. But still, you have to understand the plot to kill all of the Jewish people had already started. The king had already issued an order, an official decree, that all the Jews were to be killed on a certain date. And so the drama is not over. Eighth chapter of Esther. The first thing that the king does, he gives Esther the house of Haman, and he also honors Mordecai. You remember that he discovered that Mordecai was the one who had revealed that plot to assassinate the king and had never been honored, never been awarded anything. So he gave Mordecai uh, the house of Haman and Esther and Mordecai, Esther was the queen. So they're doing very well, and they could have easily remained that way. But if you look at the third verse of the eighth chapter of Esther, Esther now has to intercede on behalf of her people. She has to get the king to reverse his order to kill all of the Jewish people. And once again, she goes into the presence of the king not knowing how that would turn out. But once again, he raises his royal scepter. She's allowed to come into the presence of the king, and this time she weeps. She weeps for her people. She weeps that the order to kill all of the Jewish people has already gone out all over the empire. But the king is moved by his beautiful queen by her tears, and so this is what he does. He orders Mordecai, he gives him his official ring, and he tells Mordecai to change the orders, to write another order, to reverse the order to eliminate the Jews, so that the Jews would not be eliminated, and in fact they could fight for their defense. And so this is what Mordecai does on behalf of the king. But now there is a race. Is the word going to get all over the empire in time to save the Jews? It's in different languages. It, the, the drama is increasing as there are, are couriers riding on horseback, going as fast as they could to the far reaches of the kingdom. But of course, we know that it has a happy ending, and so it finally reaches all of the places in the kingdom. Meanwhile, the eighth chapter begins with Mordecai being dressed in royal robes of blue and white. He has a golden crown, and all of the city of Susa, the capital city, rejoices and there's a summary statement at the end of the 8th chapter. The Jewish people, the Jews had light and gladness and joy and honor. And the Jews had a feast. They had a holiday to celebrate the fact that they were about to be killed 
but now they have been delivered. The ninth chapter opens with the words that the decree did indeed reach everywhere in the empire. Not only were the Jewish people saved, but Mordecai is now revered. In the fourth chapter, I mean, excuse me, the fourth verse of the ninth chapter we read, Mordecai was great in the king's house. His fame spread through all of the provinces of the Persian Empire. For the man Mordecai grew more and more powerful. If the book of Esther ended right here, it would be such a happy ending. Such a great story. But it doesn't end here. Because beginning with the fifth verse of the ninth chapter, the Jews now, in retaliation, start to kill the Persians. And there is a great slaughter that takes place that is described in the verses. And then it continues in the 13th verse of the ninth chapter. Esther goes before the king and she asks for an additional day of persecution and killing. And at that point, they take the ten sons of Haman, the evil Haman, who has already met his fate. And the ten sons of Haman are executed, are hanged. And it continues down in the 16th verse that tells us as many as 75,000 of the Persian people are killed. And then from there, it goes on to another celebration of the Jews, and it introduces the festival of Purim, which is the happiest, most joyous festival in all of Judaism to this very day. So that's the way the book of Esther ends. There are three things that I want us to talk about. Number one is the great reversal that has taken place and how we have seen God's hand, even though it's been hidden at many times, we've seen God's hand working through Esther. She is truly the hero of this story. And then, of course, Mordecai. We're going to see the great reversal. Secondly, I want us to talk about the Festival of Purim and how it's carried out today. Because this book is something that is the basis of this Jewish festival. But there's a third thing we need to talk about. And it's the most disturbing thing. And that is this retaliation and this revenge. We cannot ignore that. It's part of Holy Scripture. I don't want to end on a negative note. So let us talk about let us talk about that that first. The Jewish people are not only given a last minute stay of execution, but they're basically given a right, a license to massacre their enemies. How do we explain this? If you look at the lectionary readings, and there's just a little bit of the book of Esther in the lectionary, but it omits this all together, and with, with good reason. You know, the name of God is never mentioned in the book of Esther, and one writer says, that's also with good reason. God doesn't want to be associated with this book. But as we're about to see, I think God is a major part of, of, of this book. So how do we explain this? How do we explain revenge? This is truly Old Testament, an eye for an eye, a tooth for tooth. When we were studying the book of Joshua a number of years ago, we had a, a lot of discussions about this because in the book of Joshua, God is mentioned frequently, and there are times that it clearly says that God ordered the massacre. 
of these people, even innocent people, even women and children. And we had a lot of discussions, a lot of discussions about this. First of all, there's no easy answer. There, there is no way that we can say definitively why this is in Holy Scripture and how do we explain it. But I think we need to understand this. In the Bible, there is what I call progressive revelation. The understanding of God that the writer of Joshua had. It's not the understanding of God we have today. The understanding of God that Esther was written much later, but the understanding of God in the book of Esther is certainly not the understanding that we have today. We believe that Jesus is the fulfillment of Scripture. And I want us to look at some of the greatest words of Jesus. In the book of Matthew, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, You have heard it said, you have heard it said of old, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist one who is evil. If anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. If anyone would sue you and take your coat, let him have your cloak as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go two miles. Give to him who begs from you, and do not refuse him who would borrow from you. You have heard it said of old, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. And pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain on the just and the unjust. How do you reconcile the words of Jesus with what happens in Esther and in Joshua? You don't. But we are Christians. We are followers of Jesus. And it is his words in the Sermon on the Mount that need to guide us. I remember years ago when I was a college student and Dr. Frank Stagg, one of my theological heroes, came and spoke and I remember a time that we had the opportunity to sit down with Dr. Frank Stagg. Several of us had a meal with him, and we had one of the most engaging conversations. I'll always remember that. And one of the questions somebody asked, they said, Dr. Stagg, is there a different God in the Old Testament than in the New Testament? And they've talked about examples like this. And this is the way Dr. Stagg answered it. He said, you run into some really serious theological issues if you say there is a different God in the Old Testament than in the New Testament. He said, God doesn't change. He said, look at the example of a mighty tree. If you cut that tree down, you're going to see the rings that run in that tree. And they run from the very top to the very bottom. But the rings of the tree are only visible where it is cut. And he said, where the tree was cut is the Jesus event. This is when we have a view. This is when we actually see the nature of God. This is where we see the rings. And the rings our love and forgiveness and compassion and understanding and turning the other cheek and loving our enemies. He said, those rings have always been there and they will always be there, 
but they're not always visible. So I've always remembered that. And I've always said that when we study scriptures, and especially problematic scriptures like this, what we need to do is we need to put on our Jesus glasses. And if what we see in the book of Esther, if what we see doesn't look right with our Jesus glasses, then it's not right. We have the complete revelation, and that's the way that we need to understand Holy Scripture because, folks, the truth is, while the Jewish people, and even when the, this scroll is read today, you know, people rejoice. I'm going to tell you how, the, how they react at the Feast of Purim, and especially in times like the Second World War when the Nazis were eliminating the Jews, when they would hear this, and this revenge, it was so powerful. But if we continue to retaliate, and if we continue to repay evil with evil, we're never going to find peace. We're never going to find a fulfillment of the promise of Isaiah that one day nations shall not lift up sword against nation when we will beat our swords into plowshares. Excuse me. We need to take a step back. We need to put on our Jesus glasses, and we need to put in put on our Jesus heart. Secondly, let's let's talk about something positive, really, really positive. What are the takeaways? What are the good things we can say about this wonderful scroll of Esther? Well, it, it, it's, it's a story about a young girl who grew up an orphan. And in a way, that's symbolic of the Jewish people. Because the underlying story in the book of Esther are people who are exiles in a foreign land. And that's what the Jewish people were in the book of Esther. And that's the way Esther is to begin the book. She is an orphan. She's taken in by her cousin Mordecai. She's one who has this Cinderella type of rise to power, but she uses that power to achieve good and most importantly, to save her people. And then as we begin to see in the eighth chapter and in the ninth chapter, there is a complete reversal that has taken place. Esther takes this risky stand. I mean, for her to go into the presence of the king, I mean, she tells Mordecai, look, if, if he's not happy when I walk in, he can have me executed. He could do anything he wants to. And so she risks her own life in order to deliver and to preserve the Jewish people. But by the end of the book, we realize that the powerful are brought low that the servant has been elevated, has been lifted up. One of the greatest examples of this is the first chapter of Luke, when the young Mary at the well in Nazareth is visited by the angel Gabriel, and he tells her that she is going to be the mother of the Messiah. And she rejoices in what we know as the Magnificat. But I want you to listen to this. Mary says, my soul magnifies the Lord, which is where the word Magnificat comes from. My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he has regarded the low estate of his handmaiden. For behold, henceforth, all generations will call me blessed. This is true not only of Mary, but also of Esther. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name, and his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones 
and exalted those of low degrees. What, what, did he, what did he do with the book of Esther? The mighty Haman came down. He was exalted and he was made low. The one who was made low, Mordecai, is the one who's exalted along with Esther. He has filled the hungry with good things, the rich he has sent away. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. So in many ways, the Magnificat echoes the story of the book of Esther. There's something else I want us to see here. There's an issue of solidarity. Esther is Jewish. Mordecai is Jewish. Once they both rose to power, they could have easily forgotten their brothers and sisters. They both took great risk to stand up for their people and to save their people. The human tendency is when you're doing okay and you have to take a risk to help others, it, it, the tendency is to kind of let it slide, to say, well, well, I'm doing fine, to become selfish. This is what we call solidarity. This is standing up for our brothers and sisters, even at great risk. There's so many examples of solidarity in human history. But one that comes to mind for me is Jackie Robinson. I don't know if any of you saw some of the World Series, but there was an attempted steal at home plate. And the Dodger pitcher Clayton Kershaw was on the mound. He realized what was going on. He threw the runner out. And as soon as that happened, I told Joyce, I said, you know what that reminds me of? One of the greatest moments in World Series history when somebody stole home, and it was none other than Jackie Robinson. In fact, they soon said, the last time somebody successfully stole home plate in a World Series was Jackie Robinson. He was one of the greatest baseball players who ever lived. But of course, we know he was a black man. He was the first black man to play Major League Baseball. It's such a great story. Branch Rickey, who was the general manager of the Dodgers, Everybody said, well, he wanted to win. Yes, he wanted to win, but he wanted to make a statement for equality. Because one of the, if you want to read a wonderful biography, read the biography of Branch Rickey. Here was a man who was a dedicated Christian. And his attempt to get a black man as a Major League Baseball player was a matter of personal faith. It was a matter of righteousness and justice for Branch Rickey that was grounded in his solid faith in Jesus Christ. But Jackie Robinson, when he became a Major League Baseball player, and of course there were so many challenges, so many obstacles, but he always stood up for his people. You know, when he first became a player, there were times that they would travel to another city and he had to stay in a separate hotel than his, his white teammates. But Jackie Robinson was one who always exhibited solidarity. That's another great lesson that we find in the book of Esther. Now here's the thing. God is never mentioned in the book of Esther. And I, I shared with you that one writer said uh, God didn't want to be associated with that book because of what they did to the Persian people. But I, I, I can't buy that. We've already dealt with that issue. God is not mentioned in this book. God does not speak. He does not act in this story. There are no great miracles. There are no burning bushes. Uh, th this book doesn't talk about Jerusalem. It doesn't talk about the promised land. It doesn't talk about the law. It doesn't talk about the prophets. But yet, by the end of the book, God's people are saved and the enemies are defeated. It sometimes feels like the powerful and often evil appear to be in total control. 
but there's always an unseen hand at work, leading to great reversals. And though God is never explicitly cited, I don't think there's any doubt that God was at work in the book of Esther through Esther and through Mordecai and through others. I want to share this saying with you. I love this. A coincidence is a miracle in which God prefers to remain anonymous. I'm reminded of a story that a nurse at the hospital told me a number of years ago. She said that, that this is when her children were smaller and were home, and every parent knows how busy it is to have a family, and the kids always have commitments, and everything's going on. And she had come in from work at the hospital and only had a short time to prepare a meal before they had to scatter in different directions. And she decided to go to she, she needed something at the last minute and, and ran to food, food line. And she said she was in a, a big hurry. She was in a big rush. And, and you always get in the wrong line when you're checking out at the grocery store. I do. Oh, she got the slowest person at the cash register. And the poor lady in front of her was trying to count out the exact change out of her pocketbook. And she said, I knew that time was running short. Uh, I wasn't going to have time to prepare the meal. And I just, she, she said I was about to lose it. But she finally checked out after a lot of time had gone by. She was on her way home. And suddenly she came up across an accident that had been a very serious accident that had just happened. She said, I stopped and I thought, maybe there was an unseen hand that was slowing me down. God is often at work in ways that we do not see. God was faithful. God used Esther. Remember that great, great statement when Mordecai says to Esther, perhaps you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Now is not the time to keep silence. And of course, she was not silent. Let me share a statement by Frederick Buechner about how God is at work in ways that we cannot see. He says, the question is not whether the things that happen to you are chance things or God's things, because, of course, they are both at once. There is no chance thing through which God cannot speak. He speaks, I believe, and the words he speaks are incarnate in the flesh and blood of ourselves and of our own footsore and sacred journeys. Be not afraid, for lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. He is always with us. He says he is with us on our journeys. He says he has been with us since each of our journeys began. And so listen for him. Listen to the sweet and bitter airs of your present and your past and the sound of him. He is always there. And he was there in the book of Esther. The book of Esther is an exciting book. It's a humorous book. It's a raucous book. It's a book and a lot of feasting and a lot of parties and a lot of drinking and a lot of tomfoolery that takes place. And that sets the stage for the Feast of Purim. So on one of our trips to Israel, we noticed one day that everybody seemed to be dressed up. It looked like Halloween, only it wasn't just the kids who were dressed up. It was the adults. They were dressed in these outlandish costumes. And it was everywhere. And we asked our guides, what's going on? 
said it's the feast of Purim. It's, it's sort of like Mardi Gras. Of all the festivals of the Jewish people, the feast, the festival of Purim, is the happiest, the craziest. They dress up in these outlandish costumes. They have parties. And, of course, they they go to the synagogue, the faithful do. And when the name of Haman comes up in the scroll of Esther, and by the way, his name comes up 54 times. And every time his name is mentioned, they cheer, they jeer, they have noisemakers. They do everything to block out the sound of his names. Now, when Esther and Mordecai are mentioned, there's jubilation. They're cheering. They're joyous. But when Haman is mentioned, they are not very happy. They boo. They have the noisemakers. And they have parties. Uh, they have parties that are rather outlandish, uh, that often get out of control. Uh, one of the rabbis said you are to drink so much that you cannot differentiate between the phrases bless Mordecai or curse Haman. Well, if you grew up like me, a teetotaling Baptist, I uh, have a little hard time with that. But that's what, and, and they don't all go crazy like that. They have all kinds of wonderful food and traditions. One is a, they have a Haman Tashin, Name for Haman. It's a triangle-shaped cookie to look like his hat, which you remember colonial days, they wore the triangle, triangle hats. And it's a cookie pastry that has fruit or some type of, of filling. It can have uh, the most popular, have poppy seed and chocolate with date, apricot, or an apple filling. So they... They really go all out, and they have all kind of wonderful traditions. But it's not all self-indulgence, because one of the great traditions of Purim is to get food baskets. And you send food baskets to the poor. Uh, you send food baskets to your family as a gift, baskets that are full of pastries and wine and chips and dips and all kind of great delicacies. And of course, the Feast of Purim is introduced in the ninth chapter of the book of Esther. It's an interesting book, isn't it? It's a book that tells us that whatever happens in life, that God is still in control. And I pray that we will remember this that we will remember that God is in control whatever happens in our life. At times we don't understand. At times when it seems that evil and falsehoods are prevailing, that God still has this. He has us in the palm of his hand. I pray God's richest blessings on you as we continue to study the scripture as we continue to allow the living word to influence our life, to guide our life, and to transform us until we can be more and more like the living Christ. Amen.